Good afternoon or evening, uh, tabletop sports fans. Anthony with Bleacher Bums Gaming, and I am excited to do uh, an unboxing of the first set of printed uh, Fall Classic baseball cards that I received today. And if you've uh, noticed on the channel, there have been, I've played a couple of games already using the PDF files as well as a couple offline. And as one uh, already positive part of this game before we unbox it is when you do order a printed set, you also get a link to download uh, PDF cards, which uh, lets you uh, play the game and get used to playing it prior to the printed set arriving. So let's uh, start with the unboxing and I'm going to do, and again, I've only played a few games, but I'm going to do an early review of the game. I like it a lot uh, thus far. And uh, I review games, sports baseball games or sports tabletop games on five areas, uh, component quality, engine, um, the uh, intangibles or nuances of the game, and also for baseball, the number of seasons available as well as the uh, game flow. So we're going to hit those five areas and give it a preliminary rating. And again, uh, the ratings for baseball are single, double, well, actually strikeout, single, double, triple, or home run. So we will be applying those for a possible total of 20 total bases overall in the review. So let's get started and unbox this bad boy. So this is, uh, I've ordered uh, actually three print seasons. Um, this was the first one I ordered, the 1908 season. I'm a huge dead ball fan, which you know if you watch the channel. Hey, Bears Dan, what's up, buddy? Welcome. Just getting started here. So, uh, and I'll, I'll get to this. It's one of the pluses, but there's, you know, very few games that have dead ball seasons available, at least games that um, I prefer, like APA does. I'm just not an APA player, too many charts. So a big plus to this is uh, the fact that I can get a printed 1908 season right off the bat. I also ordered uh, 1922 and 1978. They are not here yet. And then I ordered a complement to the game. This game also utilizes a lot of charts, but uh, for those that do not like charts, you can uh, supplant those with these fast action cards. And it's really nice. Gives you a lot of flexibility. You can uh, use the fast action cards for the dice rolls as well as results. Uh, I like to roll the dice. So I just use these for the results, and they also even have, um, you'll see on the back here, the uh, different uh, charts. This is the 54 chart. So pretty much you can play an entire game almost exclusively off of the fast action cards, which are just a bunch of mini charts, uh, which is really cool. And uh, I think the only chart I'm going to have to use is the sacrifice um, bunt uh, and hit and run chart, which, again, is a big bonus because I don't like charts. Uh, Bob's Tabletop Sports, welcome. And, yeah, just getting started. Uh, I, and I've got, I think you'll like the project idea that I have for this, too. I think it's pretty cool anyway. Uh, first of all, guys, I changed my um, – was having issues with the video being blurry yesterday. So is the video okay? And I also changed my microphone setup. So I want to make sure the sound is okay as well. But uh, let's start. Uh, first thing I'm going to review is component quality. So uh, right off the bat, you can notice the cards are extremely high quality. And I'll compare them to a couple of others, including my own game. So payoff pitch, uh, probably the sturdiest cards in the business. And you can see here, these are very good quality. Um, they are definitely more than 110 card stock. I do not think uh, they are 130. They're close, actually close to the cards that I use uh, in Glory Days Boxing, the game I publish. Um, this is 100, this is Glory Days Boxing card, 130 card stock. You can see not quite at that depth, but still very good. The uh, layout, very nice, clean and it has a nice little gloss to it, and they feel very good. And bonus, you can see compared to uh, a lot of other uh, tabletop games, and you see the cards are very big as well, which is a plus. And uh, you can see compared to Glory Days boxing cards, uh, Glory Days boxing cards, which are also very big, a um, little bit wider, but the exact same height. So right off the bat, in terms of components, that is a positive. 
and you get plenty of fast action cards. You will never have to shuffle these during a game. Like I said, I believe there's 180 total here. So very, very excited about that. And they really add a lot of flavor to the game, which I will get to as we go. So let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, the 1908 season cards. We'll just grab this. Sorry for that uh, disruption there. So a uh, positive thing is the cards, the teams, uh, for the most part, are pretty much sorted together. Uh, and again, you'll have to do some changes. But, you know, the cards have a nice color to them. The font is uh, big. It's very easy to read, which is a positive for, I think, probably most of the guys in our genre. Uh, me included, as I wear glasses when I read. So a very nice card. And again, the cards, you know, I've got a little bit of tack to them and good quality, resilient, and a very nice finish on the card. So uh, components, the only thing that I would ding, and this is really, it's not a big deal at all. The game does not come with dice, but who cares? Because if you play tabletop games like most of us have several of these, you have plenty of dice. Uh, Matt, welcome to chat, buddy. So that, that's not even a ding. It's just uh, FYI. So you can order. I, I chose to uh, just go with the rules and the charts via PDF. And I, like I said, I can download what I need. And using the fast action cards, that'll pretty much only be the um, uh, sacrifice and hit and run charts. So if you do want to order the charts, there's an option to do so. And they would come printed on the same stock. And uh, you can use those if you prefer them over fast action cards. Like I said, I'm not a chart guy. I say it enough, I know. <laughs> but the cards are really nice. And again, uh, just comparing the the, play, the team cards to uh, Payoff Pitch, which uh, to me is the best quality card in the business just to, due to the thickness. But you can see they dwarf those cards in terms of size. So very easy to read and nice footprint on the table. So for components, I am definitely uh, going to give this game a home run, top-notch components. And we'll do a little bit of the uh, – do a quick play here as I get in, as I get through the review. So very happy with that. And again, I think I have a very fun and unique project set up for the 1908 season. So the uh, game itself, the engine – and this is one thing that's kind of a, uh, I guess, a misnomer, is that people look at this and think, oh, it looks like a 50-50 game. It's really not. It's not. It's a 50-50 game in appearance only. There are so many nuances within the cards that uh, it is absolutely not a 50-50 game. And that's one of the things that really makes it, uh, I guess, endearing. You can see here... Um, use this card from uh, Brooklyn, Tom Catterson. So the standard, the batter's cards, and I'll lay out a couple in comparison. The batter's cards basically have half of the results or a little over half the results actually. And then the pitcher's cards have the remaining 15. Now they also, and just by that uh, layout, they're not 50, 50, but they also overlap so that uh, you get different results off different cards and I need to find some pictures to throw out here real quick. Sorry about that. All right, here we go. So here's Cy Morgan from the Boston Red Sox. So you can see how it's laid out. The pictures uh, have a total of 15 results broken over three categories. The batters have uh, 15 plus 6, uh, basically a total of 36 results between the two cards, and I, my math is probably wrong, but that's how it squares out. So you can see uh, the hits for a poor hitter, they could be limited to hits right here, as well as any hits they get off the pitcher's card, uh, but some cards um, can extend, like 1922 George Sisler, he has singles extending all the way down to here. So very balanced there. The other thing that's really nice with these cards is in certain ranges on the uh, pitcher's card, it will usually always be a strikeout, and that usually starts with 56, um, and some will have more, obviously. A batter that does not strike out a whole bunch 
may have a uh, just an out result over here, which overrides what you would see. And I'll uh, got an example there. Fred Birchall, you will see. I'm sorry, that's picture card. Uh, yeah, here's here's Fred's hitting card. So you can see here, Fred Birchall. If there are K's here, like on 62, Morgan has a K from uh, 1 to 2. If he's got bad stuff, regular and good, he's got a K. Uh, because Burchell does not strike out enough or very much, he's got an out there, which would override one of those strikeouts before you check the pitcher's card. So that's one of the things that I talk about when I, when I say this is definitely not a 50-50 game. It's got little nuances like that that overlap, which balance out statistics, which are very nice. Hey, Al, thank you for joining us, Al Red Sox fan. Check out that great channel. So that in itself really kind of makes the game unique. And like I said, when I first looked at it, I thought, oh, Jesus, a 50-50 game. And I couldn't have been further from the truth. As you can see, it's definitely not. And, you know, this is just a simple result. There are other extreme results that overlap um, uh, between different cards, the pitcher and batter interaction. So let's talk about the engine uh, real quick. So it's really simple. You roll uh, 2d6 and a 1d20, 4 and a 3. So you would check, uh, first of all, and I digress, before you start the game, you actually roll a 1d20 to see what kind of stuff the pitcher has. Uh, this is good, average, and poor. So you would establish that and then go through that uh, pitcher's column for the duration of the game when uh, cross-referencing cards. So 43. Uh, here, you look at the batter's card, and that will be an out. Uh, using charts, you would reference the 1D20 roll to determine what type of uh, out. And like I said, this was a must for me, the fast action cards. So I use those. You'd flip a fast action card when there was an out. Check the out column. It is a fly out to right field, and then it tells you the base situations. Uh, first to second hold, second to third advance. S runner, which means slow holds, and third, all advanced, third to home. So it really makes it simple, and it adds a nice flavor with a little bit of a description, and, and again, referencing all base situations, which is a big bonus for the fast action cards. Um, the engine itself, again, very easy. The one thing that, uh, I don't even know that it's a nitpick. Um, some, sometimes the results... I think, well, I don't even want to say a little bit too condensed. Um, and it's really, you know, the engine's good when you're trying to think of a nitpick for it, but it really flows real, really well together. I think the only time you get bogged down is with the charts. If you have to look those up, um, some of the fast action cards get a little bit wordy, but again, that just adds flavor. You can see here, um, it breaks down every base situation on this ground ball out. So, you know, that's not a detriment to me, but that could slow you down, especially if you use the charts. But overall, I think the engine is a solid, uh, a very solid triple. And the one ding I do have on the engine, and that also kind of relays into um, the intangible part, is with the uh, splits. Um, the uh, splits are not very robust. They do have, you'll see here, the splits are usually only on 26 and uh, sometimes on 25 if there's extreme. But really the only splits I have seen or encountered has to do with if this is a left-handed pitcher instead of an out, this would be a single. If it's a righty-righty matchup, it would be an out. Uh, one thing I'd like to see there maybe is a little bit more uh, accountability for things like strikeouts and things like that. And I'll use... Uh, like 1978, Jim Spencer is an example. He was horrid against left. He struck out a ton against righties. He didn't rake, but he was noticeably better. So, you know, maybe a little bit more extreme like that. But again, I think over the course of the season, uh, we'll see it. It will play out fine. So for uh, engine, I give this a, like I said, solid triple. Uh, flow of the game. Um, this, this would be a solid home run, but again, the charts, if you use charts, will bog you down. Uh, the fast action cards, I think, play very nicely, make it quick, and it's, it's kind of seamless to me. So definitely uh, for flow, a very solid triple there as well. Um, and again, there's a uh, the 54 chart, which is referenced here. Um, it has the... Uh, 
results there depending on the situation, whether it's a uh, wild chart, wildest, et cetera. And that would be one more time where you uh, actually you, you wouldn't have to pull out a chart because it tells you right here what the results are. So, yeah, very well put together, and it adds a lot to the game and really improves the game flow. If it, if it was just charts, it would be a single or a double, but fast action cards take that to a solid triple for me. Uh, the nuances and in intangibles, and we talked a little bit about those um, when I was going through the cards earlier. And let's talk about home run uh, interaction, too. So here I've got uh, Burchell's card back, his pitcher's card back on there to go with his hitter's card. And also we'll throw uh, Fielder Jones on here from the White Sox. Actually, let's do Frank Isbell. So here you'll see that um, on 65 it is a home run pitcher minus nine. So what you would do in that situation, this is a really cool nuance. Uh, you look at the pitcher's home run rating. So Cy Morgan would give up home runs on a 1D20 roll of 1 to 15. And you would minus nine on that for somebody who's not a big power hitter, Isbell, and 320 bats ranked one in 1908. So the uh, final result there would be one to six, which is super cool. So um, pitchers or batters that do not hit a lot of home runs. Uh, Patsy Doherty here from the White Sox had zero. That just becomes an out. So uh, there he has no chance to hit a home run. So a 65 will always be an out regardless of what on, is on the pitcher's card. And just to close this, if you do roll above the home run rating here, that would be coming out a uh, fly out to center field, which once you play the game a couple of times, it references uh, out result eight, which is a fly out to center field. And that's easy to memorize. So, yeah, the, the, the uh, intangibles and nuances, again, I like how there's interaction or a crossover between some of these results uh, for strikeouts. And again, we'll reference uh, Burchell's card where he'll turn strikeouts into outs. Uh, pitchers or batters, I'm sorry, that uh, do not have a low number of strikeouts, they will just be blank there. Or if they have a high number, like you look at more modern day players, they'll have some strikeouts in that column too. So overall, the game balances nicely. Uh, another thing I like about that, it has an automated steal system. So dead ball era, um, Players used to run a lot more frequently than they do in modern times. So a single with a plus uh, would be a stolen base attempt. And there's multiple ways to uh, do the stolen base. And again, this is another nuance to me is the flexibility that the game has. So you can just roll for the stolen base attempt right off that plus. Um, I like to still roll for a jump, which uh, on the player's card here, the batter's card, he has a jump rating of 14, which uh, means he goes frequently, and a success rate of 9, so he steals at under 50%. Uh, you would modify the jump rating by the handedness of the pitcher. If it's a right-handed pitcher with a weak arm, you'd give a plus 2 to the jump. Average arm would be a plus 1, and then um, a strong arm would be no effect if it was a lefty. He would get a plus two or a minus two, sorry, to the jump if it was a strong arm, a minus one for a, an average arm, and no adjustment for a weak arm. So it, it takes that into play. There's also adjustments for the catchers uh, trying to throw a batter out based on arm strength. So a lot of little, uh, a little things there that uh, come into play that aren't really apparent when you just look at the cards and look at the, uh, you know, because the card again, and this kind of goes back to the engine. It's very simple. I mean, very simple. There's not a massive grid. You don't have to page through, you know, a bunch of columns or whatnot, or add numbers together. Uh, it's it's right there. So only a few results, and it it just seems, but it works. It's got some splits here uh, for doubles and triples, and just works out really well. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the pitcher stuff, which I just touched on uh, briefly early. So here again to start the game, you'd roll a one d twenty. So one to six, Cy Morgan would pitch. Uh, his at his excellent best stuff, I guess I should say, or above average stuff for the entire game. And again, the flexibility of this game, I'm going to actually house rule that where 
if a pitcher rolls anything but normal stuff, so poor stuff or great stuff, after three innings, I'm going to re-roll that. If he rolls the same thing, he gets to keep it. If he rolls anything different, uh, he would then revert to um, average stuff. And I'm going to do that just to see how it balances out. Uh, and also based on a conversation I had um, on another video I posted with someone who actually had spent uh, several decades in major league scouting, where he made a very good point. A lot of pitchers sometimes take a minute to – find their groove. Others like Bob Gibson, he used as an example because he saw him pitch. <laughs> um, they'll come out of the gate fast and tend to uh, lose that stuff later. So with Gibson, if he rolled really, you know, his best stuff coming out of the gate, it's highly uh, possible that he would kind of take a step back into fourth inning or, you know, you look at a control pitcher and I'll just use someone like Greg Maddox. Maybe he uh, starts out a little rough, but Maddox, the more he throws, the more he gets honed in so he could potentially raise his stuff. So that's – anyway, that's how I'm going to house roll it. But, again, this is a great touch. Uh, one of my favorites, actually, of the game is, is the way this comes into play, and it definitely adds a lot of variety to it. So, hey, Robert has joined us. Uh, Al, yes, to answer your question, you roll the dice – and you flip the card to replace the charts. And like I said, I've, I've studied the fast action cards, and the only thing I think I'll ever have to look at a chart for is uh, sacrifice and hit and run. So uh, does this game have foul outs and a good distribution of line outs inside pitch and payoff pitch? Do not, and from what I can tell, having only watched. Uh, it does. The card, the fast action cards really take care of that for you, Matt. They've got, um, there's a line out right there. So it's got different varieties of outs, which affect runner advancement, um, different uh, ground outs. So you align out straight back to the pitcher there. And then there's a possibility to, um, if you want to even add a little bit of spice to that, uh, the 1D6 that you roll, the white one, you can go and reference a different uh, um, position player. And you can see here, just looking at this, if you do go with that option, which I will, uh, pitcher here, it's a lead runner doubled off. Uh, these are not. And then foul tip to the catcher. You go down and check this three-star result. Refer to the catcher range rating. B drops it, gets another roll. S catches it, strike three, batter out. Uh, a, the home catcher catches it, strike three. The away catcher drops it, better roll, batter rolls again. That's on the average uh, range rating. So yeah, it's it it does bring that into play, and it's really cool. You can see this is a great example of uh, what I'm talking about with very good nuances of this game offers. So to answer your question, yes, it does have those, and they do come into play. Thank you, Robert, for stopping by, buddy. Uh, tell if you're still here, what do you have going on tonight on your channel? Um, beyond that, the uh, oh, I'm sorry, defense, uh, defense, I didn't cover. Uh, defense is also on the fast action card. So if you roll, the way this works is really nice too. It it kind of balances out strikeouts. So if I roll a 51 through 53, it's got KD question mark defense. So the first thing you'll do is look at the uh, pitcher's card, depending on the stuff they have that day. So Cy Morgan average stuff. If that one D20 is a one or a two, that becomes a strikeout. If it's above that. You go to the defensive chart, and the fast action card will tell you what you're looking at. So 51-52, uh, uh, third base error, shortstop error, and the one star means uh, one base advance if an error is committed. And then a uh, 53 is the range column. So that would be a pitcher uh, range check single, uh, runner's advance one, possible steal attempt to center field. So – it uh, really relays all that information out for you. And if you were doing that, then you would just roll an additional 1D20 and uh, resolve the error or range check based on that, based on the uh, fielder's rating. And while I'm talking about that, another nuance. So with the uh, defensive ratings, now, th this is really nice. And in the link, I put a link to uh, the Tabletop Baseball Helper. You can download from that site as played score sheets of uh, pretty much every game ever played in Major League history. Now, if you want to just get up and play, you can do that. And instead of having to write down a bunch of ratings, print the score sheet. Batting orders are there. 
And instead of average, and it does have columns to add different ratings for uh, defense and, and running and whatnot. But if you don't want to do that, every season comes with a complete game defense chart that you could just uh, tape up in the wall in front of you, put off to the side so you don't have to fill in the score sheet with that information. Uh, you can just check the uh, chart based on the result. If it's a range play, error check, et cetera, uh, what the arm strength is has the same information here for the pitchers as well as their usage stats and what the pitchers ratings are. Um, and I really did want to show this because one comment I got on a video I was doing when I was playing with a PDF is the uh, pitchers card did not have an uh, ERA on there. You can see here, if you're looking, it would help if I had a damn pitchers card. So if you're looking at the pitchers card to get a determination on how good he is or who to bring in from the pen. It does have whip, which is, is probably a better indicator than ERA. But um, if you want to check the ERA, that would also be on the uh, team rating chart as well. It's got the ERA, and then it has a number of shutouts, uh, home runs per nine innings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then uh, Ks and, and hits and whatnot. So this is a really great touch that comes with the game. And again, another uh, a subtle and intangible thing, but it makes playing through uh, the season a lot easier. You don't spend time filling in score sheets with this information. Uh, you can print them and play. So I wanted to throw that in there as well. So yeah, with... Um, with these intangibles, again, the splits kind of take away a little bit, but um, overall, definitely a solid uh, triple for me there as well, too. So uh, the final category is number of seasons. Um, this game has been out. I don't know what Greg does to rate his season so quickly. Um, he's got some algorithms he uses. I know that, but uh, and yeah. Apparently, he's a math genius, too. But this game, uh, from what I can tell, 2016, it came out. So, you know, give or take, it's it's been out not not even five years yet, um, five full years. So it's got uh, 103 seasons. And that that is a no-doubter upper deck home run because of the variety it offers. And like I said, right up my alley, it's got the dead ball season. And hey, Tony, what's up, buddy? Wake up and welcome. And uh, Tony said with PDFs, he'll write the ERA on the card. Yeah, that, I mean that's cool too. And it's it's really you know I'm gonna I'm gonna experiment the way I play sometimes using the score sheet with the ratings. And I I don't mind it. I like looking at the whip anyway to determine who I'm gonna bring in. But you know, again with this sheet, it's just a quick glance, and you can see you know this is the White Sox Ed Walsh with his stellar. 1.42 ERA and 11 shutouts when he won 40 games that season. So uh, definitely a big home run on the number of seasons available, and especially in the uh, short time the game's been out, relatively speaking, uh, you know, about five years, like I said. So overall, that would give us a total, three triples and a home, two home runs, a total of 17 total bases out of 20 for my review. And again, that could change based on gameplay, you know, with the engine and intangibles, et cetera. But um, at this point, uh, based on the small sample size of playing and just studying the rules and looking at the cards, definitely this immediately vaults into my top three baseball games with inside pitch and payoff pitch. And, uh, you know, it's got some bonuses over those two. Again, I really, really, really like the uh, detail on the fat cards. Uh, size of the cards are cool and it's a, it's just a very unique game engine and you got to give uh i guess points for that too he managed to fit really every possible result on the baseball field between the pitcher and batter into a relatively small footprint he didn't have to go you know by multiples of 100 or whatnot this is basically multiple of i mean 36 results between the cards and he makes it work and you know a lot of that has to do with what comes off the fast action cards the uh, variances in different plays and whatnot. So it's super, uh, super good game there. So that out of the way, uh, I wanted to talk about a project I want to do. So with 1908, 
um, if you're familiar. So uh, so I also have a link if you have not seen this game or uh, are interested in checking it out. I have a link to the website also in the description. So uh, please give that a shot. And as you're joining us at the ballpark, if you don't mind, drop a like for the uh, video, the unboxing review. So definitely this is to me is a uh, must buy game. Again, top three for me with inside pitch, payoff pitch, 17 total bases out of 20. Very unique game, different really than uh, anything out there. And again, I will say it again, don't be fooled by the way the cards look. This is definitely not a 50-50 game. There are a lot of variances and different nuanced interactions between the pitcher, batter cards, and then the fast action cards. So um, I'll put a more expansive one here. So, and you can see, I mean, these things just, it really adds a lot of flavor to the game with the descriptions that those give it. And, you know, it's quick, it's a quick play too. It really is a very quick play. Uh, one roll of the dice resolves the majority, almost all of the at-bats. In fact, the only additional rolls you really have to make if you want to steal uh, there, or if uh, an error check or range check comes up, there'd be an additional 1d20 roll if you use the uh, defensive results off the fat card. And then finally, too, here it also uh, gives you the advancement on a base hit. So this is a base hit to left if that was a single. Uh, one to three runner holds, two to home, single or double actually, two to home, a uh, weak, you would advance on a, uh, a weak arm and then a um, average or strong arm you would advance with risk. And what that means is you basically take a chance advancing and then you roll uh, against the outfielder's assist rating. So you wouldn't want to advance on a uh, arm like Roberto Clemente. And then one to, one to first to home, which would be a double, uh, two bases, and then an F-rated runner on first scores, which F is for fast. And, and the other thing, too, I want to point out on the ratings, very, very simple and straightforward, easy to tell. The uh, Again, the arm and error ratings, but for the batters, um, here, arm ratings, it's weak, average, or strong, you know, so very simple there. And run ratings, fast, average, or slow, and that's it. And then the uh, fast action cards or charts, if you use those, incorporate those ratings into the advancement. Uh, I won't spoil it, but what a game it was. Just incredible. Did you just get finished playing this? So... <laughs> And I, and I did gesture uh, him between him and Tony. They got me really onto this game. Like I said, I kind of uh, not paid much attention to it because I thought it was simplistic and 50 50. And after watching their videos and reading the rules, it is anything but. It has a lot of flavor and a lot of diversity in the results. Um, so, Matt. Uh, let's see someone play. Yeah, that's that's what I'm going to look for now. And again, I'll talk about that in my project. But um, I, I think, uh, and Tony's played a pretty good sample size. He's playing a uh, 1980 Open A's replay with a few other people. So I know it's still not complete, but you could probably uh, add in, you know, your comments there, Tony. I think uh, I think overall, what I've what I've heard and seen, uh, the results over the course of the season are very uh, very accurate, very comparable to uh, inside pitch. Um, I think inside pitch is maybe a tad more accurate than uh, payoff pitch. Both come very close. If you saw my payoff pitch uh, 69 Fergie Jenkins replay, a lot of his numbers were almost spot on. Um, thing, and the numbers that weren't, like Ennings pitch, the user or player, me, controlled that. Uh, his ERA was probably the biggest variance between real life. Um, but, you know, again, that depends on the dice roll. But, you know, very payoff pitch, inside pitch, both very accurate. And, and from what I've seen and heard, this is right there with them as an app a game in terms of accuracy goes. So, yeah, so yeah, Tony's, his, uh, his game is, or uh, project is almost complete. And I'm going to, I'm going to be able to get a pretty good um, understanding. This, this first project will be a smaller one, but with three teams, I'll have a pretty good sample size. And this is what I'm going to be doing with that. Uh, IDJ, Apple Basic, I saw you got that in. I was watching that uh, unboxing. But, yeah, I, I think this game is going to hold up well overall, Matt. Definitely do. So what am I going to do for a 1908 project? So most people, except IDJ, who hates dead ball games, are familiar with the Merkel game. It happened in the 1908 pennant race. 
Uh, the Cubs and Giants were playing at Polo Grounds, and the game was tied going into the final inning uh, with darkness setting in. And it was a pivotal game in the pennant race. It, this was September 23, 1908. So the Cubs and Giants were tied. The Giants had six less games, three each in the loss and win column. And the, uh, they were in first place by percentage points at this point. And then the Pirates, uh, always strong, were only uh, a game behind both teams. And if you're familiar with that time period, the uh, Brooklyn Superbas won the National League pennant in 1900. And from then up until 1914, when the Miracle Boston Braves won the pennant, the uh, National League pennant was won by either the Cubs, Giants, or Pirates. They kind of had a lockdown on the National League during those years. So uh, this was 1908 is regarded as probably the greatest pennant race in history across both leagues. So the Merkel game, um, Merkel was a rookie and a game-winning hit occurred in the ninth. And Merkel as was the standard custom in those days. Instead of going all the way to second base, seeing that that would uh, score the winning run, he just uh, veered off and started toward the clubhouse. Now, it's always been a rule, obviously, still as now you have to complete your path to the next base in order to uh, satisfy a walk-off or a safe hit. And otherwise, it would be a force out. Uh, Merkel did not do that. And most of the time, nobody questioned it. Nobody uh, tried to apply it. But Johnny Evers, the Cubs second baseman, is probably one of the greater baseball minds of that time period. Uh, he was totally aware of the rule and he uh, went after the baseball. Uh, fans were storming the field. Uh, both teams were out of the dugouts. And according to the story, Joe McGinnity, who did not pitch that day, um, obtained the actual game ball and hurled it into the masses in center field at the Polo Grounds. Uh, Evers somehow came up with a new baseball, touched second base, and declared that uh, Merkel would be out. There was a lot of discussion appeals, and ultimately it was uh, ruled that according to the rules in play, whether they had been enforced previously or not, uh, Merkel did have to touch second base, and he was ruled out as, of course, fate would have it. You knew it would happen. The uh, 1908 season ended in a tie between the Giants and Cubs, so they had to uh, replay the suspended game. The Cubs won that and went on to the World Series where they defeated uh, Ty Cobb and the Detroit Tigers. So after that long-winded background, hey, Daniel, welcome, buddy. It really is. I, I'm really going to enjoy playing this, even with a small sample size right now. Um, very, very much uh, enjoying the game. So what I'm going to do for the 1908 project, it's going to be uh, the Merkel, uh, Beyond the Merkel game will be the cause or the name of it. And what I'm going to do is starting with September 24th of that season, I will replay every game of the Giants, Cubs, and Pirates uh, through the end of the season to see who wins the pennant. And again, it's only going to be a couple of uh, weeks worth of games, so not a massive project, but uh, it should be fun. And what I've done I've, in the process of doing now is uh, actually getting the player stats through September 23rd off of baseball reference, which you can do by their game logs. And I'm going to enter those uh, for those three teams into an Excel sheet and then just add the stats for my replay on top of those to see by the time the season ends uh, where they finish up. So that'll accomplish two things. One, it will, uh, determine if things turn out differently, if the Merkel game would have even mattered, or maybe the Pirates come back and overtake both teams, or maybe they still end up tied and still have to replay that game, which would be kind of cool. Uh, and then the other thing, Matt, in regards to your question, um, it will give a pretty, it'll be not a huge sample of games, but it will kind of provide a fairly decent sample size to see where the players' end-of-year stats end up in relation to what their actual uh, end of your stats were. So uh, I think that'll be a fun project. And again, not overly ambitious. It's just three teams uh, playing. Um, I didn't check exactly, but I think it's like uh, 15 or 16 games each. And uh, we will start from September 23rd on and see if uh, the game world matches reality in the final uh, 1908 National League pennant race or if we have a different winner. So that will be the project on the channel and uh, looking forward to that. 
So 190 IDJ, uh, don't you mean 2008? I think you misspoke there, BBG. IDJ is one of those uh, closet um, dead ball fans. He just will not admit it. Uh, one guy in our group has played five seasons, and this is, again, stats. They uh, have all held up well. Yeah, I, I just, again, a very small sample size, Tony, just looking at the way the cards interact and everything he's taken into consideration. I think it's a very well-designed game. I, I see that happening, too. Um, and this must not be one of your fun facts. No one has died yet. <laughs> That, that was a harmless uh, fact, though, when McGinney threw the uh, baseball into the fans in center field in the polo grounds, uh, it struck a spectator in the head and caused a skull fracture. Just so I stay up with my uh, fun facts. I don't know if that happened or not. But, um, I'll be watching the 08 stuff, even though I know squat about that error. You know what? I mean, if you want to read a ba if you read baseball books and you want to read a great book, just not a great book about this season, but uh, about the dead ball era in general, uh, pick up Crazy 08. Uh, I've got a copy of that. I've actually read it twice. Um, it's very well written, uh, goes into detail, pulls up a lot of uh, newspaper articles. Uh, a lot of research was done for sure. And the uh, writer not only provides a very good picture of the uh, pennant races in both leagues, but also a, a very good picture of what life was, uh, what society was like in 1908. You know, things that you just don't hear in other places like at uh, Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, how the uh, field would be covered with soot from the nearby factories and how it would uh, be the players hated playing on it when it was like that and it was damp because it, it was hard to get their uniforms clean so just a lot of uh behind the scenes stuff uh, from that era there as well also another book of the dead ball era i would recommend that i'm reading now is um the uh first great world series God, i forgot the name of it um it's basically a book about the 1912 world series between the um Red Sox and the Giants, and that goes into even greater detail, not only about the dead ball era, but about what life was like in that time period. It interjects some new stories of the uh, day, and uh, let's see what it is. I should be able to see it here on my Alexa, sorry. Well, just type in, if you're interested, just type in 1912 World Series and it will uh, it will take you to the book. I think it's called the First Great World Series or something like that. But yeah, uh, definitely baseball, dead ball era is my favorite time period in probably sports period, as you can maybe tell. But so much, uh, so much to learn there. So let's uh, finish the chat. Um, let's set something here, blah, blah, blah. So Tex Leaguer, Payoff Pitcher, Fall Classic. Um, I couldn't answer that now. Right now it would be Payoff Pitch only because I have a, uh, a bigger footprint playing that game. But um, this, I can already tell this is going to do some things that uh, Payoff Pitch doesn't do, uh, probably with a greater diversity of results uh, based on the fast action cards. Um, payoff Pitch has a very unique game design as well. Uh, and, and, and payoff pitch also has fat cards too, which I utilize with dice rolls for uh, defensive checks and runner advancement. So you couldn't go wrong with either. Like I said, this is already top three to me based on a small sample size with payoff pitch and inside pitch. Um, the one thing I would maybe give an advantage to payoff pitch uh, on are the batter splits for sure. Uh, Gameplay, they should both pretty much be about the same speed to get through a game. Um, yeah, so it's it's really, like I said, payoff pitch slightly now, uh, but that could change. And regardless, I mean, I don't think uh, you could go wrong with payoff pitch, this, or inside pitch myself. Uh, inside pitch, probably the one uh, negative to that or nitpick, I guess, that I hear from people are the uh, base running rules take a little bit to get used to. Uh, in fact, I homebrewed a chart that I use when I play inside pitch. And the games do take a little bit longer because there's – uh, generally almost always two dice rolls per at bat. So that would be a nitpick with that. But again, all three games, very, very well done. They stack up well. Uh, yeah, and they, they definitely are two different games. Um, 
IDJ is doing his sales pitch by both. Uh, payoff pitch is definitely a blast. Um, <laughs> that's the great stuff. Uh, fall Classic Baseball, I agree, is very different, and it offers lots for guys that want a bit more. And, and I think that's a very good way to sum it up. Again, a nitpick with the splits. I don't think that they are as expansive as they could be, but it's not a killer for me because – it does everything else so well, and I think over the course of the season, uh, the results are going to even out fairly nicely. And again, the variety in the results because of the fast action cards cannot be beat. So, yeah, and, and it's, uh, I was just saying what Tony was typing, a little more depth in results variances. Uh, life in 1900, sitting around watching grass grow, thinking of ways to catch a ball without hurting your hands. They had gloves then. Come on, man. And uh, uh, well, Crazy OA is, is that's definitely the first book I would recommend. Um, I'll put that in there because it, it goes into a lot of detail about this season, and you know, it covers it covers the Merkel game, not as in not as much in detail as uh, some other specific articles have, but it still has a big. Uh, a big section or chapter devoted to the uh, purple game itself. I'll get you. The, I'm getting you the name of that other book, the 1912 World Series book, right now, Tony. Um, okay, it is called the First Fall Classic: The Red Sox, the Giants, and the Cast of Players, Pugs, and Politicos. So. So that is the book there, and and like I said, it does have, it does bring in a lot of uh, a lot of news. Uh, there was a big uh, corruption trial going on in New York at the time. It covers that quite a bit in the book. Very interesting read. It's got some great quotes from uh, John McGraw and others in there, and some good behind the scenes stuff. So recommend both of those books, Crazy Away and the First Fall Classic, if you want to learn more about the Dead Ball era. Yeah, no, and then, like I said, you can't go wrong with any of these games. So that's pretty much it. The unboxing, like I said, uh, if you missed it, the um, final review and the again, the early first access review is 17 total bases out of 20, which puts it right up there with inside pitch and payoff pitch. So looking forward to getting this on the table and starting my 1908 project, which, again, will be uh, – beyond the Merkel game, and we will play out the final couple of weeks of the 1908 National League pennant race between the Pirates, Cubs, and Giants replaying all their games and uh, accumulating stats from uh, September 23rd on to see how they ended up in relation to the final actual regular season stats. So hey, thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, appreciate it, guys. ID Jester, check out his channel. He had an app game up earlier, or just put an app game up, and had a nice unboxing of the um, uh, APA sets that he ordered that got there today. Uh, Bob's Tabletop Sports. And again, he's going to be getting his channel up and running again. Uh, Bears Dan 007, thank you very much for joining. Matt, 1933. Steeler fan, 1933, thank you. Al Red Sox fan, check out that great channel. And Al doing a lot of stuff with, uh, he's done some Glory Days boxing recently. Pro Football Strategy, and of course, his one-and-done tournaments are always awesome, as are the chats with Al. Uh, Tony at Cards and Dice Baseball TV, playing every baseball game on the planet. RJL518, Robert, paying a uh, payoff pitch. He's also got some Fall Classic up on his channel. And of course, our friend D. Scott Howard and Tex Leaguer. And making sure I do not miss anybody else. So, hey, guys, thanks for uh, Daniel McCord. Thank you as well. So appreciate you all stopping by. And any last questions about the game before we sign off? But you'll, you'll see how it plays out. And like I said, with the fast action cards, I'm really excited. I've been uh, – I played one game using the charts um, online, and then I played a second game doing a online fast action deck. But I'm really excited. This is probably the most exciting thing uh, to me about this game because of the flavor it adds. So – We'll see how it turns out. But anyway, I hope everybody has a good uh, evening. Thanks for stopping by. Anthony with Bleacher Bums Gaming. Remember, if you are not smiling, you're not doing it right. Hope everyone has a great evening. Take care.